Hello, I'm Suzanne James for Greenwick. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we live and work and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge all people of diversity in its many forms and champion their right to self-determination. Special treat for Greenwick followers today, we're being joined by Judy Cannon. She has been recently elected new independent MP for Wollandilly and the Southern Highlands in that bloodbath that was the recent New South Wales election. Judith is an optometrist, a former mayor of Wollandilly, and has a strong background in koala protection and trying to have development laws changed to save native areas. Now that the Minns government is in minority with a much more environmentally friendly crossbench, does this mean we will finally see some real environmental reform in New South Wales? To talk to us about that now and her new job is Judy Hannon, MP. Judy, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. I'd also like to acknowledge my Indigenous population in this area. We've got the Gundagawa and the Darawa people. I'd also like to acknowledge them. Thank you very much. And I'd love to say congratulations. And how's it been after the first week in the new job? Well, the first week's been very, very interesting. Um, lots of learnings that are going on. Um, I'm sure I'll have lots of learnings for the next four years. There's always something new popping up, but really interesting, and I'm hoping we can make a big difference. Okay. At the last election, it was clear there was a number of issues voters clearly wanted to address, hence the election of a number of independent MPs such as yourself. Let's start with gambling reform. Now, that's been a big one on the agenda, especially given Chris Minns will out before the election and said he wanted a mini trial rather than an actual trial. You know, as you know, New South Wales is the only, has more poker machines than anywhere else on earth besides Las Vegas. So what, what's your take on gambling reform? Are you seeing the fallout other communities seeing in your area? So in my particular area, I haven't seen a lot of fallout because we're all very small towns and villages. Um, I might just get rid of my watch that's doing a buzz back there. Um, but we are, yeah, we don't see a lot of gambling issues directly here. But um, as a former mayor, and certainly in the area I lived in, Granville, I've, you know, seen and I can't underestimate the effect of poker machines have had upon people in the area. So I'll be looking for the reforms. Um, I will be open to discussing uh, what true reform is, not just trials to the industry, and trying to break the ties for the problem gamblers. Um, I don't want to push them off into a different area of gambling as well, and I'm sure there's lots of details to learn about yet, but in principle, yes, I'm in favour of gambling reform in New South Wales. We've seen a lot of venues go pokies free voluntarily. It's happening more and more, including venues such as Peterson Bowling Club, who have comprehensively proven a lot of what Club New South Wales said about we can't survive without the poker simply isn't true. If it was the right reform, as you've described it, would you support something that gets rid of all poker machines except in casinos, such as is proposed by the Greens? So obviously I'm going to look for the detail and look for my community feedback. But yes, personally, I'm in, in full favour of reform of the sort you're talking about in New South Wales. I'd like to move on now to housing, which is another major hot button issue that keeps coming up over and over again in local, state and federal elections, especially here in New South Wales. As you know, New South Wales is more accident prone than most when it comes to private developments taking over public land and housing stock. It's, a, it's currently a housing greed crisis that's driven by a lot of factors. Mortgage stress, rent gouging, homelessness, all of those things are at an all-time high. Are you seeing the spike in those indicated in your electorate? So remembering that we've got different towns and villages and the, um, the background of the citizens in all of those areas is quite different. But I have to tell you at the moment, I'm seeing an incredible number of homeless people and families that are literally sleeping in the basements of Coles and Woolies of a night time. Um, so this is um, an issue even somebody brought up to me this morning. Um, they get some rental subsidy, but she said there's not even houses around to rent um, and certainly not in the price range that people are expecting them to get these rentals at. 
Um, I think it's going to be an ongoing issue and it's certainly something that I'm quite keen to look at. Uh, we're looking at working with some of the local MPs that are above us and having a kind of forum with all the stakeholders that we're going to bring in and have a chat about the housing and also bring some people that are affected in to tell their stories to see if we can't come up with some solution. We probably won't know the actual results, but I believe if we get one person into housing or, you know, settled, then I think we've achieved something. Would you vote for a proposal such as a rent freeze and or some sort of limit on short stay operators? And obviously federally there's also a bend in there with negative gearing and empty stock being tied up every night of the week. What's your view on those issues? Would you vote for a rent freeze? So I'm not sure about the rent freeze. I haven't got my head around the um, economics of that because I certainly don't want to decrease the number of houses we've got out there. But I know in my area in particular, we've got houses sitting there right at this particular point in time, houses in good condition that are sitting there empty and buildings that belong to government that are sitting there empty that are empty every night while people are out there freezing without a bed to go to. Um, so I'll certainly be looking at um, ways and means to, to look at that. Um, I know that we've got some rental legislation coming up and I'll be really keen to really delve into it um, and support, there's Minister, An An I call him Anilak Chandavong, um, who is looking at, um, at some of these rental issues. I'll be happy to listen to him and support whatever comes up in those bills. And, you know, we want to make it more affordable and cost of living is really, really hurting people out there. Yes, I think even across the board, it's, it's a lot of people don't even have a basic roof over their head right now and something yeah. simply has to be done about it sooner rather than later. And the gazumping that's going on is just terrible for people out there. I call it gazumping. Um, yeah. it's, it's bidding, but like really it, that shouldn't be happening and it's something that we're moving towards stopping. It's all about tenants rights isn't it it's all very well and good to say it's not legal but how are you going to get it enforced in a, in a seller's market. Yeah. 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 Also on the local government level something which you no doubt had significant input during your campaign is the forced council demergence that was foisted upon New South Wales some time ago. Now you'd be aware that there's a number of groups advocating for a free vote so that people can have um, a local vote to decide whether or not they wish to demerge by a council area. Some groups are trying to have the legislation of the Local Government Act amended to facilitate that, given that some want to stay merged because, as in my own electorate, I must confess it's been an improvement, but in other electorates they've suffered serious price gouging and rate hikes because of it, and it's been a disaster on a number of fronts. Would you um, support a proposal to change the Local Government Act so that if an area does democratically vote to demerge that they're able to do so? I'd certainly support a democratic vote on demerging. I have to say we've been really lucky in the areas that I'm in, in that we were feared merging, but we, it never happened to us. Um, we've got half of our electorates under administration as well. So I'm really keen to see local people get their local voice in democratically elected councils. And in the areas that want to demerge, if their communities want to do that, then I'd be very happy to support that. Speaking of democratic rights, I'd like to talk now about discrimination and human rights. As we're all aware, rainbow rights have been in the news again lately for all the wrong reasons, a la Mark Clayton. Um, he's also had a go at Alex Greenwich. You know, Alex is taking him to court, basically, suing him over his disgusting homophobic tweet. What's your take on Mark Latham's comments under the disguise of religious freedom? Um, and will you be working with Mark Latham in the parliament or as suggested by Chris Mintz, um, won't be doing a deal with Latham because of his behaviour? What's your take on all of that? So I don't get any opportunity to deal with Mark Latham because he's in the other house and I consider myself very lucky on that regard because I'm a very proud mum, mum of a gay gentleman and I find the comments that Latham made were totally disgusting. Alex Greenwich is such a gentle, well-considered human being that works so hard for the people of New South Wales. And I will throw in any support behind anybody that rubbishes him or in fact, the gay community in any shape or form. 
And the same goes for me. He's, he's a great guy, Alex, and he's got, honestly, hostage-level negotiation skills. The deal he did in Parliament over the BAD and the way he operates, absolutely a joy to behold, and, and I'm sure he's got a lot of support in the community. I'm sure he and his lovely husband know that, so that's great to hear. They're very respected. He's very respected in Parliament, and he shows respect to everyone. I haven't seen him argue or shout at anyone, but he puts his point of view across very, very well. I'd like to ask you now about water. Hmm. Now, ever since water became what MP Helen Dalton now calls an unregulated $2 billion commodities market, New South Wales in particular has been beset by all sorts of um, issues with water security, buyback schemes, allegations of fraud and corruption, in some cases proven, uh, what's happened at Menindee Lakes with fish kills. What's your equivalent in your electorate? What are the water security and contract issues you're experiencing there? Can you take us through what that's like for you? So I actually preside over an area that has five of the major dams for Sydney's drinking water supply. And one of the greatest threats was the selling off of the assets that we have. Um, you only have to look at the um, candidates forum we had where one of the major questions asked is would we consider selling off Sydney's drinking water and I think to an extent that was one of the downfalls of the government. Um, I can't wait to vote to legislate to keep Sydney water in our hands and we've already had a first reading of it but I also understand there's areas that are concerned like the Murray Darling and I have concerns that um, there's areas like that that the effects of CSG, that some federal members seem to want to desperately, um, they want to protect the CSG. Um, and to this end, I believe that government departments should be treating water management independently, away from anyone who could influence the supply to single companies. Do you have experience as yet with lobbyists approaching you in Parliament? I know it's your only one week in, but has anybody... No, no I haven't. I haven't. Um, I have been very lucky. I think I've got a very open and transparent office. So we've had, you know, some different um, things like the pharmaceutical board and people like that lobby, but really nothing that I would call as a dangerous lobbyist. And um, we'll see what happens, but we'll be transparent when they do come knocking. And I'm sure they will at some point. Still on the subject of environmental protection, you've got quite a background in trying to protect native areas and koalas in the face of everything from CS CSG pipelines to developmentally um, compromised governments, we might say. Talk to us about what your issues are down there. You've got a pipeline there, is that right? Uh, we've got um, some shutting down at the moment, so we're lucky in that particular area. But Liverpool Plains and areas like that are being really affected by those sorts of things. Um, just going back to the koalas for a second, this just shows, so we had, when I was mayor, we had 13,000 signatures on a petition that we took to Parliament and Parliament spoke about it for five minutes, less than five minutes. And I was disgusted by that, but I'm more disgusted by the continued destruction of the habitat that's gone on since then. So going on to, um, you know, environmental issues, um, I'm lucky I've been able to afford an EV and I'd really like to help see rebates for residents who are interested in making that switch instead of the tax rebates for multinational mining companies. Um, and I'm not talking about getting rid of our local jobs because we've got mining in our area. It's about priorities. And my priorities is for my local residents and the environment and what's good for all of us in the long run. Now that we've got an environmentally friendly crossbench and a men's government in minority and a lot of environmental supporters such as yourself coming in independent and or teal candidates, do you think we're going to see real reform when it comes to the government being owned by developers? It's been so difficult in New South Wales for so long and, and they always seem to have to push and shove no matter how many numbers are against them. How do you think that's going to play out? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to see how it, how it plays out. Um, certainly when I see the voting and the divisions that happen in Parliament, they really don't need to ask the parties. They only need to ask the crossbench where we're going to shift because we do, to an extent, get that ability to make some decisions, not as a block necessarily, but we do have that 
influence at this particular point in time. So I'm hoping we can use that influence to, um, you know, help protect the environment. And I have to tell you, in my first week of parliament, the only sensible, respectable um, speakers I've seen have been the green speakers. They've been the only ones that have put forward some really common sense issues. And they've not necessarily been about the environment, but they've been respectful and the best for New South Wales. They really started to make a name for themselves this time around. They've, they've really got it together. So they stayed in federally. They've got a great team. Just yeah. before we finish, Judy, I'd like to ask you something that came into my inbox late last night. Thanks, Ben. Mm -hmm. Was your pick and bypass media release? Mm -hmm. Can you give us a quick two minute rundown on what what's happening there? So for the past thirty years, Picton, which is one of our major towns in the area, is literally linked, you know, one side to the other by a hole in the wall under a railway line or a one lane bridge that is falling to pieces. And you know that we suffer from fire and floods and often we need to evacuate people. And yet we've got these two little sort of evacuation points and even during normal day, it's an issue. So money has been promised for over 30 years to build the Picton Bypass. And all of a sudden we've had um, an official minister come out and say you know that money's gone in opposition he's now saying that money's gone but none of that money was ever in a budget so it was fantasy money it, was, it may as well have been monopoly money because it wasn't really there and I'll be fighting to make sure you know it can't happen instantly but I'm going to make sure that any money promised for this is actually going to deliver something and be real money so that we know that we'll actually get that bypass in place. So once that's done, what difference, just tell us briefly, if you will, what improvement that's going to make to the community and what's the environmental cost of that bypass likely to be? So it's going to go through some land that's um, privately owned and government owned. So it's going to go across an area that um, has the sewage system in. It also is, from what I've seen, not going to have any poles going down into the water. It's going to be a span and it will save the amount of um, traffic that's held up and going through Picton as a town centre. So environmentally, it will be good. It'll cut down the amount of tra uh, traffic going through Picton. It'll make it much more efficient for people and it'll be safe for people in, in situations where there's fire or disaster. So it will make a huge difference to our area and the environment. I'm glad to hear you mention the safety factor because in all these discussions I often have with MPs, they're so focused on the project, on the footpath, on the, the corridor. The, the people that actually live there often get forgotten in the melee. That must be frustrating for you, yeah? Well, when you see when the fires were on, there were queues for hours trying to get through that hole in the wall. And, you know, smoke and fire was headed towards all of these people. We had people that were elderly. We had people that were pregnant. Um, all sorts of issues and people were just stuck in queues of traffic for miles um, and you know we need to be able to get people in and out just in normal daily situations as well without sitting in traffic for hours on end. Judy it's been great to talk to you today thanks so much for your time you must have been overwhelming the first week what was it like? It's a little bit unbelievable, I have to say. It's been like being on a Disneyland ride or something. I'm not sure when I get off. I bought this ticket to get on. Um, and I do tell you, my husband left the country the minute that I got elected. He went on a walk um, in England from coast to coast. Um, but he's back now. And so reality is starting to sink in. And I'd be delighted to talk to you anytime, Suzanne, with any questions. I'm open, transparent, but also really eager to hear what different people's opinions are because that's what I learned from. Well, this is a great way of doing it. It's yep. fantastic. All right, well, thank you very much for your time today, Judy Hannon, newly elected independent MP for Wallandilly and Southern Highlands. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day out there. Thank you. Thank you. Still with Suzanne James on Green Left. Thank you for joining us. We've been speaking to Judy Hannon, independently elected MP for Wallandilly and Southern Highlands. She's joining a new team in New South Wales Parliament starting last week, trying to finally get some good change in New South Wales. Remember, if you like our work, you can like and subscribe to this video or go to, go to greenleft.org.au and find the many ways that you can help be part of the solution 
instead of part of the problem. I'm Sir James for Green Left. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>